bring authors at all in the events. Uh, today, we're hosting a conversation with author Dr. Mary Stockwell, talking about her book, Interrupted Odyssey, Ulysses S. Grant and the American Indians. Um, Dr. Stockwell, Dr. Stockwell will be in conversation with Dr. Brian Shane, Associate Professor and Chair of the History Department, and the James Richard Hamilton Baker and Hostetler Professor of Humanities here at the University. Dr. Stockwell received a BA in History from Mary Mance College and an MA and a PhD in History from the University of Toledo. She later became a professor, a history professor and department chair at Lord's University in Sylvania, Ohio. And after earning two Earhart Foundation Fellowship Awards, Dr. Stockwell left teaching to become a full-time writer. Some of her prominent books for young people include The Ohio Adventurer, A Journey Through Maine, and Massachusetts, Our Home, which was awarded the 2005 Golden Lamp Award from the Association of Educational Publishers. Additionally, Dr. Stockwell has authored historical books that include The Other Trail of Tears, The Removal of the Ohio Indians, which was a 2016 finalist for the um, Ohio Library Association, Woodrow Wilson, The Last Romantic, a 2018 Dartmouth Medal nominee, The American Story, Perspectives and Encounters to 1865, and Unlikely General, Mad Anthony Wayne and the Battle for America, published in 2018 by Yale University Press. She's written multiple scholarly essays on American presidents, such as George Washington, James Madison, James Monroe, Abraham Lincoln, Woodrow Wilson, and Franklin D. Roosevelt, as well as many other scholarly works. Uh, so in addition to our Authors at Alden event today, Dr. Stockwell will also deliver the Central Region Humanities Center's annual lecture based on her book, Unlikely General, Matt Anthony Wayne, The Battle for America. Um, that will be at 4 p.m. this afternoon at Baker Center, which is 242. And tomorrow, she'll be speaking at the Athens branch of the Athens County Public Libraries, uh, where she will be discussing the book, The Other Trail of Tears, the Story of Ohio's Deportation of Indigenous Peoples. So we're really thrilled to have Dr. Stockwell and Dr. Shane here with us this afternoon for a great conversation. Over to you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I love Ohio. I, don't, I know so many people are trying to get out of Ohio, but it's wonderful to see so many people here and so many people and students here because it's, a, as I call it, what the French used to call it, the beautiful country. Um, I want to tell you how I came to write a book about Ulysses at Spain. And it started when I wrote The Other Trail of Tears. When I wrote The Other Trail of Tears, which is a story of the tribes in Ohio leaving and going west, I saw something. And if you're history majors or you're historians or no matter what you are, sometimes when you're looking at the past, you just keep hearing the same thing. And one thing everybody told me when I was writing the, uh, the uh, removal of the Ohio Indians, Andrew Jackson was evil. Andrew Jackson was evil. It was just a relentless, why are you bothering? It's just Andrew Jackson, racist, evil, stand up, move on to the next thing. And I think that limits us then when we're trying to figure out why did our country do what it did. One thing I realized when I wrote The Other Trail of Tears, I suddenly saw Jackson and what he did. I said, Jackson did to the Indian service what he did to the banking industry. Um, he literally took a national program that had been running since the days of George Washington, and he simply threw it away. And he allowed local authorities from that point forward to handle things. And I said, that's the exact same thing to the bank. Remember the bank? Hamilton sets it up, they get the second bank going, and Andrew Jackson simply comes along and says the bank is worthless, dangerous, corrupt, how it goes. He, he dismantles it, and he turns the banking of this country over to local people, local institutions. I suddenly saw his impact, and I said he overturned what everybody had been doing since Washington. George Washington had come up with an Indian policy where he said, we're going to go west, I'm going to open it for sale and settlement. We are going to have wonderful things out there, including Ohio University, which is in the Northwest Ordinance. So I'm going to respect the Indians. I'm going to send my representatives out west first. We're going to write treaties, and we're going to buy this land, and we're going to pay the Indians not just once, but every year from then on. They're called the Indians. I'm going to set up fur trading posts down there. 
all those tribes that we've been fighting for so long are going to become our allies. They're going to turn their back on the British at last. They can push the British hopefully back into Canada. What this means is that before any settler goes out west, starting in Ohio up to the Mississippi River, the U.S. government used to go first. U.S. government goes first. Uh, they, some people like Benjamin Lincoln are sent out to write treaties with the Indians. Uh, the annuity payments are set up. The trading posts are set up. Here come the settlers. Here come the farmers behind them. That works up to the Mississippi River. It doesn't work perfectly. Uh, Anthony Wayne's story is going to be the story of when the tribe said, we don't like this, stay back behind the Ohio River. About, what, 20 years down the road after him, here comes Tecumseh. Tecumseh says, I don't care how you're doing your Indian policy. This is our country. Stay out of it. That causes the War of 1812 on the Western frontier. Despite those two big blips, I don't need to discredit them in any way, there's an orderly way we're moving west. Jackson washes his hands of this. When he says, everybody on this side of the Mississippi River can go up to the west side of the Mississippi River without really laying out a plan of how they're going to do that, he washes his hands of any money going out across the Mississippi River from the U.S. government and having an orderly system out in the Western country. I sometimes think Jackson was just too much of an old colonial fellow. He could see up to the Mississippi, he could see past it. Well, what does that mean? It means that from 1830, 1840, 1845 onward, there's chaos on the West. There's no one government official. The president's not out there trying to straighten things out. Here come the people racing west. Here come miners and trappers. Here come gold miners. Here come uh, uh, settlers. Here come my, my ancestors are going to come from the tiny little town of Sazam, in the, uh, in, which is now it's about 63 miles southeast of Prague. Everybody's racing out west. No president steps in after Jackson and says what to do. Nobody does. The very first order that you try to see out west comes in 1851, when one lone Indian agent, a guy by the name of Thomas Fitzpatrick, at Fort Laramie says, I think things are really getting bad in the west. I think it's terrible. I got an idea. How about we push the Indians in the northern plains up towards Canada, and we'll push the ones down, oh, maybe around the Comanches, down around Texas, not to destroy them in any way, not to harm them, We'll even pay them to move them. But we got to get them out of the way so if these trains so people can go to Oregon, can come all the way down to California. He's the first person, not President Fillmore, just a, an Indian agent who said, we got to fix this chaos out in the West. And the chaos continues. When I learned about Thomas Fitzpatrick, I'm going, why would this nobody out in the West be setting Indian policy across the Mississippi River? That's when again I saw Jackson. My God. We need to see him as destroying Indian policy, um, going back to Washington the way you see him overturning the bank. He didn't think anything of it. He thought the West was so huge, so big, one big reservation. Uh, it'll be fine, the tribes will all be out there. Who in the right mind will want to settle on the Great Plains? That's kind of the attitude of Andrew Jackson. Just think of what you know about what's going to happen to the West in the 1840s, the gold rush. Uh, the, war, the war in Mexico. Think of what happens in the 1850s. Bloody Kansas. Uh, think of the race to Oregon. Think of the trains coming in back and forth. No federal authority is out there. That's when I realized U.S. Grant. U.S. Grant, he becomes president. I suddenly saw him coming into view. And again, I don't know how you, how you learn things, how you write, how you teach, but I have to wait for this it kind of was haze, and suddenly I see something that was happening. You stand back and you watch it. And I suddenly realized U.S. Grant wanted to put the president back in charge of Indian affairs. U.S. Grant wanted to be the guy who goes out, writes the treaties, gets everything under control. And I said, someday, if I ever get a chance, after I got the other trail of tears done, I go, oh, I'd love to go back and write about U.S. Grant. Do you know how you put something up on the shelf that's back in the back of your mind? Um, had no intention of writing a book proposal, trying to write it. I just said, if the chance comes up, I think I got a story. Um, I go a lot to the South for some reason to give lectures. Uh, I give a lot of lectures to 
to teachers in Louisiana. That was I was hired to come down there, and it's that's where I met the directors of the Grant Library. You know, Grant's library is in Mississippi. So <laughs> we met. Uh, they said, Stockwell, you look semi-intelligent. We are looking for people who can bring to life the grant papers. We've got a grant library nobody visits at Mississippi State. We've got grant papers published in libraries nobody reads them. We've got grant uh, papers are online and nobody accesses them. And they started uh, working with Southern Illinois University Press. They said, how about we put together books that bring grant to life and get people interested in him as a person, not just a general. I said, Stockwell, got any ideas? Oh, if I got an idea. <laughs> <laughs> I think U.S. Grant is going to be second George Washington. I think U.S. Grant came and took hold of the Indian service. And then I said, I don't know what he did with it. In school, I was taught that he put missionaries out on the Indian reservations. I said, well, maybe he just used them because he could control them. But I, that was enough to get a book deal. <laughs> I said, I'm going to figure this out. So I begin to study who U.S. Grant was. What did he do out west? How did he come up with a new Indian policy? And I can tell you right away, I realized I was completely correct. He did try to take control. He did see the chaos in the west. He did come up with an Indian policy, putting the president, the executive branch, back in charge. But he had no intention of missionaries. How in God's name <laughs> would U.S. Grant send missionaries west? Everything I had read, everything I had been taught, Grant sent missionaries west. I discovered no. U.S. Grant worked for about four years of developing an Indian policy. You see me those pictures. He worked with his best friend. His name was Ely S. Parker, who was a Seneca Indian. And this Seneca Indian had been his military secretary. That's his drawing. You can get this in the Library of Congress. Um, see the second man from the left? This is Appomattox. It was Elias Parker who sat down and wrote the agreement between Grant and Lee. Uh, Grant and, and Parker had known each other since Galena, Illinois. And one reason the Seneca brilliant scholar, engineer, loved Grant, he said, when I met him, and please don't be offended by this because this is very politically incorrect to say, but he said, I like you as Grant because you know what? He does not remind me of a white man. He's so quiet. Whites talk constantly and are always bragging. <laughs> I'm white. I talk constantly. <laughs> and he said, Grant's more like an Indian. He's quiet. He's standoffish. It takes a long time to get to know him, but once you know him, you're friends forever. And they became friends forever. And again, he's the military secretary with that aside. Together, these two men between 1865 and 1869 developed an Indian policy, all on their own. Uh, they asked people for advice out west. They asked Grant, uh, they asked Sherman, Pope, everybody, what can we do? But by the time he becomes president, he's got a fully formed Indian policy. Grant was the general in the armies. He didn't just go home after Appomattox. He ran the armies of the United States for the next four or five years. When he becomes president, he makes his friend, Elias Parker, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. And down the road they go, and this is what they do. They say, we're going to uh, take command. The president makes the decisions. The executive branch makes the decisions. We are going to fire everybody working in the Indian service. And we're going to replace them with soldiers. And their duty will be to protect the Indians, to protect the tribes from the settlers racing their way. We're going to give them a generation or two to realize the world is changing. Hopefully they will find new livelihoods for themselves. Grant thought that most of the tribes would eventually become ranchers. They realized the buffalo are going. They have to transform. But a point would come when the tribes had educated themselves, found a new way to live out in plains in the Rockies, and then they would be welcomed into the United States as citizens of the United States. That's his point. And when I discovered that, I thought I was just, I said, how could this have been missed? How could people do this Quaker stuff, this missionary stuff? Well, I discovered that as this policy is being implemented, the outrage 
and the rebellion and the hatred toward this policy from Congress, from, um, from reformers who didn't like the fact that Grant might say, let's Christianize and civilize the Indians, but he never did that. It was just, stay there, we'll protect you. You decide what you want to do, how you want to live, and we'll help you. But down the road, we're going to be citizens. Many of the tribes hated what he was doing. And one group who absolutely despised the laws, I hope you can see him. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. It, it, he made one serious mistake in his policy. He set up a thing called the Board of Indian Commission. He envisioned it, that it would be educated whites, educated Native Americans, and that they would advise the president. Instead, by the time he's president, a lot of rich men who have helped North win the Civil War won on this Board of Indian Commissioners. They're led by a man I had never heard of, William Welsh. I had to dig through books to find him. And William Welsh vows to destroy Grant's Indian policy. He said, I'm going to stop it. I'm going to topple the savage, who's now one of the Indian Affairs Department, and we will overturn it. Congress does work to overturn it. It's a long and terrible story. And maybe I, I let me end here. I'm not going to tell you how it's destroyed. But um, I started to see something else. I love that name, Ulysses. And it's like, oh my god, this is like the Odyssey. This is like the Odyssey. Grant had this vision that somehow we're all going to live together. Um, his ancestors who came from Boston as a Puritan, the freedmen in the South that he's protecting, my ancestors in the 1870s, uh, the most poverty-stricken people on the planet are coming from Ireland, Poland, and again, the Austrian Empire, looking for opportunity. He goes, you can come in. He brings another group in. And that's all the tribes that we have been fighting for 250 years. He said, I want you in as citizens of the United States. And that was his dream. But that's why I called the book Interrupted Odyssey, because this dream is going to be completely destroyed. And um, I found the book, as I wrote it, to be absolutely heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. That's why I start. If you read the beginning, I'll stop. <laughs> but I be, I'm sorry, I didn't put my bones. Right. I, you know, because I go, well, I go, I'm going to write it like the Odyssey, where I'm going to talk with the, the uh, themes about it. I think you you know, Oh, I can slide it past editors, and then we'll see what I'm doing. <laughs> Let me see if I can get this. I, I said, um, looking at the end of the prelude. All right. I kept thinking of the Odyssey, you know, how Odysseus is trying to get home. He's got this vision, I want to get home. And I said, I need a quote that describes who Grant was, this famous, famous guy. If he had just walked away from politics, you know, he'd be up on Mount Rushmore probably right now. We would worship him. Um, but he decides to get into politics, and of course, he, he I'm going to save the Indians. I am going to protect them, and it's going to be wonderful, and we're all going to be one happy nation. Um, maybe he should have heeded the warning that the nymph, nymph Calypso gave to his namesake, the hero Ulysses, who had also ended a terrible war long before. This is what Calypso said to Ulysses. But if you only knew down deep what pains are fated to fill your cup before you reach that shore. You'd stay right here, preside, preside in our house with me and be warm. I said, that matches this man who I think could have, you know, it could have um, not gotten involved in politics, not tried so hard. Uh, but it's all going to crash down around him. And I'll leave you with one thing. The, the thing that begins to undo his policy about a year and a half in, uh, Congress says, no more soldiers out in the Western country. No soldiers running any, any reservation. Let the Congress then themselves pick who wants the reservation, whether they care about the Indians or not. And it's only then when Grant said, I'd rather have missionaries running the reservations than having you guys. And that's when he begins to put the missionaries in. But I'll leave you one more one thought. <laughs> I talk a lot. I don't like that. <laughs> oh my god. Um, uh, Talk ten minutes here. I go. Um, and it, I never. If you write a book, I never put in, write the appendices first. I wrote the appendices first, and I did. Here are all the soldiers he put in charge of all the reservations in 1869, and then I did the second appendices down the road when he's forced to take out his soldiers. Here are all the missionaries he puts in place. 
and this is just, it's an unraveling, it's a tragic story. Stop. <laughs> white, white girl. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Stockwell, for this, for this book, Rich, and I encourage everybody in the audience to, uh, to, to purchase a copy right, right over there. Um, yeah, I thank the library for organizing this, this wonderful event for a lot of the participants. I don't know so. if I thanked everybody. Thank, I thank the history department. Uh, thank everyone. And of course, thank the library. And thank the Athens Public Library. You guys are too gracious to me. So you're just very kind, and I'm so honored. To be here, so thank you. Yeah, so our plan uh, is to probably talk here conversationally. I'll, I'll ask uh, Dr. Stockwell some questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience for uh, the questions that you might have uh, about what you've heard or, or if you've had a chance to read this book, any questions that emerge from it. So uh, you mentioned the title uh, and, and, uh, and the Odyssey part. I wonder if you might flush out a little bit more the interrupted uh, part of the uh, title. Well, was it that, that, you, that you take this story? Uh, uh, that you bring to life what's the interactive Well, that, the Odyssey part, one thing I notice when you read Grant's speeches, especially his first and second inaugural address, he's got a very clear vision. He wants us in a world without war. His second inaugural address is stunning. If you go back and read that, he talks about we're going to get rid of armies and navies. We're never going to fight again. We're going to be one world order. I always think I'd like to go on Fox News and read that, and you know, say who who is writing this, and they'd say Karl Marx, and I go, no, U.S. Grant really believed in this kind of world order. That somebody, is, I, I guess I didn't realize that somebody was welcoming my ancestors. In. I didn't realize how many came during U.S. Grant, and no one's. It's going to the earth, the Irish. You can't go anywhere. When we come to America, but he's helping the freedmen, and he's helping the Indians, and he's helping everyone. And he's talking about his heritage. It reminded me of um, Walt Whitman's gorgeous poem, Song of Democracy, where Walt Whitman talks about how we're all in this boat together. And if you haven't heard Howard Hansen's beautiful Song of Democracy, you can go listen to it, it's gorgeous. But I got that such a sense of, he is Odysseus, he's got that gorgeous name, he envisions this tremendous um, a kind of a ship of democracy, all of us are on it together. And uh, somehow we're citizens and we're protected by the Constitution. I see him starting on his path with his friend uh, Parker. They're putting the, the soldiers in charge. They are telling traitors and anybody who has been out there torturing the Indians, maybe uh, getting great stuff from the government, selling the chief and giving them rags. You're gone. Grant says, I'm putting these soldiers in charge too because I can get rid of them. <laughs> they do something that I don't like, and I, I court martial them and out they go. It's so bizarre to hear this, because when we think of the army of the West, it's every Western we've ever seen. It's every movie we've ever seen. That the army is evil, and he doesn't see things that way. He sees these as people who will help him. When I watch the Congress starting in 1870, you know, they're not seeing this movie out of scene that Grant and I are seeing. They're not. I, 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 my, uh, maybe they're not happy that my ancestors are sneaking into the country. He's, he's, I'm a Catholic and Jewish ancestry, so we are, you can't get any scum here. So here we come, polluting the Northeast. And here he wants us in the Northeast, blacks are in the South, Indians in the West, and Congress just revolts. And I guess I watched it when you kind of arc the book up. And then from the point of this howling within a year and a half of his presidency, as one by one, Congress dismantles him. We're, we're going to stop him. And then I watch this man, the Board of Indian Commissioner's head. He goes in and he stops it. And he decides, I'm going to wreck this policy. I'm going to make sure that that savage is thrown out. And I'm going to make sure that, you know, I'm in there helping to appoint all these missionaries. Um, Congress then will also get rid of the treaty system. And when you get rid of the treaty system, that means that the U.S. government doesn't go out and talk to the Sioux the way you would talk to the, to the French or to the, um, to the British. But you're not going to sign a treaty that the Secretary of State signs. They misbehave. Um, you know, you, you round them up, send them on a reservation, and you execute their leaders or you imprison them. It, it, it's, it's so terrible. 
It's so terrible that eventually um, this man will um, will put literally put Parker on trial, accuse Grant and him of running a corrupt Indian uh, Affairs Bureau. Um, there's going to be a horrible, horrible trial in Congress of Grant's entire policy, and it's destroyed. It's destroyed. And Parker quits and says, yeah, "I had it. Everybody's nuts." The Board of Indian Commissioners takes over and is pretty much going to run Indian policy until Franklin D. Roosevelt wakes up and says, hey, I think the president should be in charge. And just so it's like if we're arcing to this great vision, of, I, I love his vision. So I have to, I'm, I'm on Grant's side. I agree. I think he's trying to do the right thing. I think we all should be American citizens and live together in some way. And then it's just those final chapters. I had to go chapter by chapter by chapter. How people start to destroy this vision. And then Grant himself says, I don't care anymore. I don't care what goes on in the West. And he loses hope himself. And now he washes his hands of the Bodocks, the Masoo, the Comanche, the same way that, that um, Jackson had done. It, it's like a Shakespearean tragedy. Yeah. There's a lot buried in this book that you can kind of tease out. You mentioned, you mentioned this, this vision, and key for Grant's vision is this belief that, that Indian peoples uh, can and should become American citizens. And, uh, and, and I wonder, do you see that vision as part of a larger rethinking in the post-Civil War period about what it means to be a citizen? Uh, I know, you know if you're familiar with the, with the Reconstruction era, that's you know, the biggest legacy, the thing that we know most, is that slavery is, is ended and uh, there's a pathway towards birthright citizenship that emerges for uh, people of African descent. And, and um, is, is, is Grant's view uh, of what's taking place during the Civil War fighting, uh, you know, the, the role of African Americans, the role of Indian peoples, uh, the instrument by which he opens up his view of American citizenship to be more capacious? He, he sees the Constitution, and he looks at that 14th Amendment, and he said, this, this is the key. The key is somehow, if we are citizens, we're protected and we have all the rights of the Constitution. We have all the rights that come to us through the laws of the United States. As long as we all say that's who we are. Because he didn't want you to come here like, my crazy Irish ancestors can't, can't come here and still think they're in Iowa. No. You know, maintain some of your traditions, but you have to admit that we are now in this thing called a constitutional government where you get your citizenship and then you participate in this democracy and you live and you help with this country grow. This was one big problem. You know, when you're looking back at how did we deal with the tribes, nobody ever said, nobody ever offered American citizenship. Nobody offered state citizenship. This is going to come up in the other trails. Um, Jackson says leave. Nobody in the state of Ohio comes forward and says, would you why not like to stay here and be citizens of Ohio? And then you'd be protected by the laws of Ohio. Nobody did that. There's really only one person um, in American history for Grant who thinks constitutionally, and that's James Barber, the um, Secretary of War of John Quincy Adams. He's the first one who says, we keep fighting each other like we're different nations. Well, come on, we gotta live together. Their solution is let's live together under the Constitution, become citizens. And Grant used to say, then you can protect your land. Then you can protect your children because you'll be protected under it. It's going to take Franklin D. Roosevelt to figure out, hey, maybe there's a third way. Why couldn't you keep land, say you're Shawnee, you got a Shawnee reservation. Why can't you be a citizen of the Shawnee Nation? Why can't you have a constitution, celebrate your heritage, we'll help you, the U.S. government will help you, and you're a citizen of the United States. So it's going to be FDR to figure out dual citizenship. And sometimes when I study FDR, I Great. Couldn't have George Washington thought of it, offered it? I'm not saying Tecumseh would have gone for it. He would have said, no. Uh, when, the, when Grant is trying to build, the, he's got this wreckage of his Indian policy, it's all ruined. Then he concentrates on the Indian territory, back to your question. And it's like, oh, why can't we invite everybody to move to us in Oklahoma? Oh, and like, why can't it enter the Union like Ohio did? Remember the Northwest Ordinance? He had three stages of territorial government. And he said, why, why can't we do that? 
and then eventually you become citizens of the U.S., you'll have an Indian state, which would be Americans. Everybody in Oklahoma wants to go for that except the Cherokee. Yeah, Cherokee, yeah. Say. <laughs> yes. You don't need Ukraine. So it's, it's not, I think that's the neat thing to me about studying so much in our history. It's never black and white. It's like, if I was in there at any of these times trying to figure out what to do, I mean, I couldn't go be a sound bite, you know, on MSNBC or whatever. It is, it is people trying to make these massively difficult decisions. And I think that's why I like history, teaching it and writing it. I've been speaking about it, because to me it's like American historians. We're, we're showing lessons in democracy. Don't let this happen to you. <laughs> if you could figure out a better way than what Grant did, or Washington did, or FDR did, or what Tecumseh did, you know, apply it today and all the miserable problems you have. You've got to start being real creative. Yeah, your book does a great job of showing the complexity of the, uh, the dynamics within different Indian groups, but also within uh, different groups purporting to represent the United States or the yeah. United States government. Even. And there really isn't a clear homogenous perspective on, on any of these. Um, it, all, it does raise the question, I mean, one of the striking moments in the book is, is Ely Parker trying to help negotiate this constitution that yeah. should lead Oklahoma, what would become Oklahoma towards, yeah. uh, towards statehood. Um, uh, Parker's an interesting, an interesting person, as you show. He, he's a you know, Seneca Indian, uh, but he is a Douglas Democrat who Douglas is, Democrat. Who is uh, yeah, in support right. of like <laughs> American expansion, and uh, and it's it's it's. it's I'm trying to square that with uh, with somebody like Sitting Bull, who's another major character, uh, to see the tension that would exist between uh, between us. And, and what led Parker to have this? considerable faith in the American army to be the promoter of peace, uh, in uh, the, the idea of U.S. expansion. Uh, um, and, you know, that isn't exactly the way that Sitting Bull would have seen No, it, it, it doesn't fit. I, I see this right now. I don't know if this is how you see the world. I see the world as people want the past to be so simple. And they pick their side, good and evil. I'm good. Those people are good. And everybody else is evil. And that's not it at all. When you're standing back in the midst of this, people are making decisions every day. Um, Ely Parker is raised on the Tonawanda Indian Reservation. He is, uh, uh, he's of the Wolf Clan. Uh, I, I don't know if he still uses these terms. He's full blood Seneca. He becomes the leader of his tribe when he's 18 years old. But he also realizes the world has changed. We, we can't just sit on this reservation and keep constantly saying, Remember the good old days when we, we ran the Ohio country and we were training and we pushed the tribes out and, oh, we hated the French. It's like, that world is gone. What world can his people have? And he goes, education. He's obsessed. He learns everything he can. He's a great leader. He's brilliant. When he can't become a lawyer, because they would not allow him to take the bar exam in New York, he goes and studies engineering. And he ends up an engineer on... Um, He's in charge of all the lighthouses on the Great Lakes. And he's out in Galena. He's going to build some institutions for the U.S. government. He sees the West as, this is great. I have an opportunity here. He loves Douglas. We forget that about Stephen Douglas. Stephen Douglas was, don't fight about slavery. Let's open Kansas. Let's open Nebraska. Slavery will die out on its own. Let's build cities and railroads. And he saw the world that was coming. He just, as Lincoln said, we can't go forward unless we fix this big, horrible problem that we're not living up to our ideals. But he loved the West. His attitude was the attitude of the majority of people who are Native Americans up to that, which is, this is our civilization. We are part of it. Most Native Americans don't live on reservations. They have been regranted to them, really, by FDR. Uh, they are citizens of the U.S. If you don't believe that, Go see how the Navajo voted in Arizona in the 2020 election. Um, they, one reason they won, that you know, Biden won Arizona is because they got the Navajo to the polls. I mean, and they, they are American citizens to this day. So I think we have to, we have to be careful that we don't just idolize to come to City Bowl and all that. They, they had one view of things. Then there were people who said, maybe we can be in the middle, like the Cherokee. And then you had people like Ely Parker who was, I embrace the United States of America. I'm here as much as Stockwell's goofy Irish ancestors. 
know, they, they saw it that way. And that has been one thing in Native American history. That's when the wars are done, it's one together. And it's a, I, I'm a blender. I say I'm mixed race. I'm Irish and English. So it's like I, I, I maybe because of my heritage, especially in Ohio, we got to blend together. Four of us I, I like that. I guess I gravitate to people who are looking at me, even though I, I, I love to counsel. Part of me wishes a little one. Part of me is like, oh, come on, destroy Ohio. <laughs> it's, it's a better story than a movie. <laughs> and I, I do think, too, maybe you see this, the Westerns, we can't, it's very hard to see the West. That's hard to see Native Americans. You know, I, in COVID, I, I must have seen every black and white Western. Just that I, I know everything that happened on Gunsmoke and everything. And I'm going, do I know the West because of Gunsmoke? Uh, do I know U.S. Grant and Custer because I watch their all Flynn movies and he was Custer? Well, wait, this, this legend we told of good and evil, it's very hard to break out of it and say, mm, oh, talk about the mil billions of middle grounds were always fighting them, I guess. Not as, you, you, you can't do Hollywood on this. But, um, I don't know, maybe this could be Hollywood because there's some tragedy. Well, I want to make sure I leave time for questions, but I think there are a couple of others that might be sort of interesting to, to think a little bit about. You, you, you raised this question of writing about uh, Indian history, and, and I'm, I'm curious about what sort of challenges this do, that does present. I'm sort of just starting to discuss that a little bit. Um, you know, it's a very sensitive subject, uh, and it, it does involve a lot of narratives, a lot of sort of myths that have been handed down to, uh, you know, to to us and what we read and the way that it's portrayed in Hollywood. How do you navigate those as a writer and a researcher? I, I swear, um, um, I swear that there's something about being a Catholic. I'm going to go back and talk about my Catholic relatives. The Catholic vision of reality is that we're, we're, we're in this mess together. And we can be saints and we can be sinners. But there really isn't a pure, there's no puritanical street in it. And that's what I avoid. Don't be a Puritan. Don't think I'm perfect, he's perfect, she's perfect, and that's all I'm going to talk about. That's all I'm going to write about. U.S. Army stinks, so I'm not going to write about it. Um, you know, the, this uh, um, a compromiser like uh, Parker, well, I wouldn't have compromised. I would have been on my own fighting, you know, chasing Buffalo. <laughs> Don't be that way. And, and as I like to, I used to tell my students, Crazy Horse and Custer. Both of these men are your ancestors. Tecumseh and William Henry Harrison are your ancestors. Uh, U.S. Grant, who's trying so hard to figure out what to do out in the West, is as much your ancestor as Sheridan or Sitting Bull or anything like that. And maybe that's the perspective I write from, okay, we got to widen forward. Maybe we're going into a new millennial way of writing about America. We have to write from everybody. We got to write from everybody's perspective. And it's funny, <laughs> the, the model would be a really good Hollywood movie. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes novelists and movie makers, because they want to show the real drama, wouldn't, they'll show everybody's perspective. A documentary doesn't have to. Uh, a book that's going to win a full surprise because it proves one thing. doesn't have to do that. But try to be more cinematic. And uh, I, I, I did it in the Wayne book, write it more like some movie, stand back, you know, get, you got the camera. When I taught writing to my students, I used to tell them, when you pretend you have a camera, we don't want to hear about you. I don't want to know what you feel about the current or later political situation. Get the camera and try to show everyone's point of view. And your, your book should give a kind of collision. But you, we know we do this as professors. This is what historians do. We, the, way the way we are taught to talk, show everybody's opinion. And, everybody to discuss and write about it. And that's, I think, we don't give ourselves some credit. I don't think historians are out there uh, fighting to teach this wonderful method we have, which is imaginatively try to put yourself in a situation that everybody had in the past. Uh, why did they do what they did? Would you, could you have done otherwise? We, we take a back seat. We let those awful sociologists get out front. They're always on MSNBC. <laughs> 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 well, hey, that's lost. You know, it, it does. It does. It remind me of, of you know something that we can, can say. Like in some ways, history is all practice. How do you practice empathy towards people today? Right. Different than sympathy, 
right? Different than sort of saying that what it is that they did was right, but at least how is it you can get to the eyes of people who have different perspectives than your own. You also, uh, uh, you, your explanation of the earlier question helped me understand more your, uh, what I took to be the sympathy you show for Father Pierre Jean de Smet. I would one keep of a the, statue One of the characters, uh, <laughs> who is a, a, you can speak, a Jesuit a missionary who, who genuinely seems to try to navigate in the interest of the Indian people. Oh, he does. It, can I say, when I was, something else too, I do think that like poets and stuff can help us. Um, the greatest writer to me is Shakespeare, because remember, he, you can't find Shakespeare in his work, he just stands back. It shows you everything. We're still trying to figure out what the heck was wrong with Hamlet. I mean, he, he shows you this, and there's got to be almost that kind of perspective, I think, of the story. And yet, not, not like everything in the past is great. You can show the mistakes that somebody's making. A Parker and a Grant, they make terrible mistakes, right, as they're implementing the policy. There are massacres throughout the West. Their soldiers massacre people. And instead of stepping in and saying, like Grant said, OK, you're out, he just sets back, OK, they don't be mean to the soldiers. They didn't mean it. It's like, oh, Grant, you, you blew it. This, you yeah, made there is a mistake. There is a bit of a gap between the, the vision and the rhetoric of that vision. Yeah and the reality uh, as and, it, and as it plays out. Once he doesn't care about the motive, and he doesn't care about the convention, he, he hands the wars over to Sheridan, and then he, he, what, he who has helped the suit, I don't care, I don't care anymore, and he lets again Sheridan put that horrible war together. It's like, this guy who had this vision, he ends up the greatest, you know, Hollywood movie, uh, president of Indian War. It's you want to take and slap him around. I'd say after about 1873 or four, and that's why Parker says they they break up. They're not friends. And Parker says in a very biblical tone, he said, "Oh, he's you know he sold his soul to the world. Um, he turned his back on his ideals. It's yeah. tragic." Yeah, there are a lot of tragic ironies in the book uh, amongst them. The, the, the fact that the, the grant that you shared. It. As, a, as an instrument in this and, policy. And, is, Sher <laughs> and Sheridan comes up at the front of the book. When Grant's trying to figure out what to do, he asks Sheridan, what should we do, do at West? Well, you, you kill him. Yeah. You know, well, you, do, you do to them what we do to the Confederates. You destroy him. Sherman tries to tell him the same thing. It's like, Sherman, I, I need better from you. And Sherman is, well, just separate them. Well, that was the Treaty of Fort Laramie 20 years before. He finally finds a guy named Pope. Remember General Pope, who lost the second bull run? He gets shipped out west to put down the Santa Sue Bull. He ends up liking the Santa Sue and not liking his own country. And he's the one, he writes letters to Grant, I get buried in the Grant papers. This is before Grant is president. And he says, I did something up here in Minnesota that really works. I got books everywhere. And guess what? I'm protecting the Indians. I'm protecting them from the settlers. The settlers and the traders are the creeps. And, and Grant uses that. One thing that drives me nuts about Grant, you want to slap him, when he faces opposition, he folds. Not on the battlefield. You know, he's got 100,000 guys with you. But politically, when he runs into opposition, oh, it's like, oh, yes, Dad, okay. You know, I don't think people have done psychological studies of him, but he doesn't fight for his position. You know, he's the opposite of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln fights, Washington fought, Jackson fought. Grant backs away. If you just watch this vision that, again, FDR would kind of grab hold of and, and make a current modern Indian policy, but Grant disappears from the story, which is tragic. I'm going to hand it over to the audience for questions, but your last comment did uh, prompt another question. It, it, it's the 200 year anniversary of, of Grant's, uh, Grant's birth, either this year or last year. Um, there's sort of been a resurgence of Grant's scholarship, as you mentioned good, good earlier. A lot of it uh, bringing his presidency into new light. Uh, the traditional narrative we had of Grant is that he was inept, that he, he wasn't really uh, inclusive, he, didn't, he wasn't really committed to any degree of racial equality. But in the last 20 years, there's been a real rethinking of that, and, and uh, most of it positive in suggesting that he has that he did contribute in tangible ways and was willing to fight to preserve the rights of free, free men in the South. Um, and I'm wondering whether you see this book as uh, contributing to that larger rethinking of, of a more positive 
do you have grant that, that, and if so, you know, how? I, I hope so. I hope so. Before everybody was here, we were talking about grant, the general, and that there are whole groups of people. He's got groups today. I mean, they come to the conferences together and they worship him. Get the big books on grant. Grant the general, grant the general. When Grant writes his own memoir, I'm a general, I'm a general. But when you stand back and you, you have to get rid of the historiography of the late 19th and early 20th century, where people were extremely racist. So they didn't like Grant because he appeared to be not as racist as that one. He actually cared about the Indians, the blacks, and again, nobody considered my ancestors whites coming here. I mean, the, you know, the clan of various varieties were waiting to stop them. He's not perfect, but my God, I could go, my God, he's a couple of steps forward. He's a couple of steps forward. We gotta give him credit, I believe, in history. Give people credit who took us a little bit forward, even if they failed. And that's how I see it. I hope people will, uh, again, um, don't start with the little big horn. <laughs> don't, don't start there. Don't start with Quanah Parker or Captain Jack. Go back and watch this man when he's a student and the only surviving drawing we have that he did are Indians talking to a trader. Um, what his wife told him, you know, watch out for the Indians, the Comanches are going to kill you. He said, there's no fear for the Indians out in the West. This is in the Mexican War later. He said, what, what have we brought to them? What civilization have we brought to any of these tribes except for a smallpox and whiskey? So he had an innate sympathy for the Native Americans. He had it for the people of Mexico. He got to find these little, like, gorgeous little gems buried in his letters and buried in his writings. He's the opposite of Anthony Wayne, who never shut up, who wrote his every emotion down, uh, up and down. Um, very quiet, very keeping it close to the breast. But you see these, these letters and these reports as he's trying to put this Indian policy together. You know, I, I, I never thought of Grant. I thought 1865, Appomattox. I went to Appomattox. Good work. 1869, he's president. Then he had four years in between where he has to run the armies and he thinks, thinks, and thinks. How can we save the Indians? How can we protect them? Where people like Sheridan are telling them to kill them. You know, once he gets mad at him, he says, How practically would we do that, Phil? Mm -hmm. uh, we got about 300,000 people out there. We just went through a bloody civil war. Where are we going to go and find them? And how are we going to execute them? He actually loses his temper. He said, To even say this is madness, it's not possible. We're going to save them. And that he says, I want them in. Because the wars are over. This, the, whatever fight, I want, I want you in as citizens. And he often said that he's the eighth generation down from the Puritans. Of Massachusetts, he goes. I want everybody here. That's how. That's how. I, that's how I'm sitting here. He opened the doors. I, one more thing too. I was just going to say. How do you? That question was so interesting. You know, how do you tell a great story? Um, when I was a kid, I loved poetry. Remember the beautiful poem um, by Jack Dunn, "No Man Is an Island." I was very idealistic, a 15, 16 year old. I wrote it down on an index card and I put it above my bed so I could read it every morning. Um, every man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. Uh, you know, therefore, never sons go, but who the gold tolls? The tolls for me. You have to have that innate realization that we're in this, uh, on this planet together, we're in this mess together. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great point, and it kind of reminds us that it's not your history or my history, it's our history. Uh, and we all have to kind of look at it. And with that, let's turn to your uh, questions uh, and give them a chance to the audience. And I'll try to repeat the questions for those people who are, who are joining us virtually. Yes, please. Um, so you talked a lot about um, the like, Congress's opposition to this. Uh, what was like the American like public opinion on Grant's policy at this time? Wait, yeah, so the question yeah. is, sorry, I'm going to try to repeat that. The question is, or you can repeat it if you'd like. What, um, you, that I talk a lot about Congress, and I go through how Congress opposes them. What did the American people think? It was split. Um, East Coast tended to be very positive towards him. His great champion was the New York Times. The New York Times was on his side. I was criticizing the New York Times. <laughs> so, but they said, he's trying his best. Out West, once you're heading to the 100th meridian, uh, people who are still fighting 
like in the, the Southwest, they think he's out of his mind. They think he's completely out of his mind. Many of the soldiers um, I think, we're not here to defend the Indians. This is madness. We're here to protect the settlers and only them. There tended to be, uh, again, a split. Um, uh, northeast positive, the far west um, a negative. You can you have to watch it in the newspapers. The Western newspapers just thought he was out of his mind, and they um, they were kind of happy. I think when the the Western newspapers were happy when the Modoc finally revoked in 1873, and then Grant turns on his policy because the Modocs murdered his peace conventioners. So, yeah, so, but there's definitely a split, uh, east and west. I, I, your comments, Mary, have reminded me what a complex person Grant was. Yes. And I, I wonder if you think one reason why historians until recently largely ignored him, ignored his papers, ignored yeah. his library, as you were saying, is, is because of that complexity. It, it just seemed, you know, you know world where uh, we're always looking for the black and, and yeah. white and the good and the evil and, and who's the bad guy and who's the good guy. He's a difficult person to pigeonhole. Um, and and you think that's why you are one of the few people who has really tackled uh, him and as you were saying, his vision yeah. uh, I, I, as president. Maybe. And, and, and there's an element of you have to, we, we rely on the written word, don't we? We've got to have a written record. I was trained when I was a kid in graduate school. History begins when somebody takes up a pen. You know, then you're the historic Indians, then you're the historic colonials or whatever. He, he doesn't open up and, and, and pour out his soul. Again, like a man, Anthony Wayne poured everything out. And he plays it close to the best. You have to not so much look at what he's saying specifically about things. What what is the correspondence? What are the debates? It's going. It's much more complex to pull this out. And when I went back to his papers, and he's talking to Parker, he's opening up more of them. But when he's talking to Pope, and he's talking to Sheridan, and he's talking to Sherman, there's a person at work there. I'm not saying you read between the lines, but you have to think more profoundly. Why is he asking? What conclusion is he going to come to? So I think I think it's very complex, and I I liked writing about his history. He was aware that he's a parent. He was aware that his family had come eight generations. He's the first one who never has any dealings with the Native American. Doesn't have any dealings with them, even though they're having chaos in the state of Ohio. Even that, to take his life, just forget the Civil War for three minutes. Put his youth against what he's given to his president instead of always the Civil War. I find that, you find that too, it's that Civil War is like a blazing light that you can't see around him. So that's true. It was in all the papers. I yeah, that's what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, my, my first ancestor, uh, Irish ancestor, was Michael Daly. He came here from the potato family and he fought at Chickamauga and places like that. So I also think to your question that, that there's very few um, presidents who were so uh, wrapped up in the in the, the way historians of youth period and reconstruction is such a that was charged. historically <laughs> such a charged topic yes. that, that Grant could be uh, uh, seen by all different types of opponents of reconstruction. Yes. And, and I think too, and he makes big mistakes. I mean, it's very hard. You know, we're trying to see if God is just corrupt, but he, you know, get wake up. Look what's going on around you. I met a young historian at a conference. This was at West Point. I was there for something else. And he started to talk about Grant. He was writing a biography of I don't know if he ever got it done, but he said, I see him in the first term as really good. And once he crosses into the second term, he just, he's going. He wants money. His wife wants money. And I didn't think of that until I heard what Parker said about him. Uh, the corrupting influence of maybe being surrounded by powerful men. I don't know. I can't say that for sure. But that's, that's the next place I'd go to study. And, and maybe that's another thing we don't do. We don't, we don't look at transformations. We don't look at progress. We don't, I, I hate to quote Bill Maher, which you give me, but Bill Maher always says the problem with us progressives 
We don't believe in progress. We don't realize that somebody can make a mistake here and slowly it can get better. And um, if somebody makes mistakes throughout the end of his presidency, he's condemned for all time. And it's like, look at everything that was done and what would you have done in that situation? That's what I used to torture my students with. Okay, I'm giving you all the power. In 1791, or it's 1865, you, you decide for us that I sit down. Now tell us, what are you going to do? I don't know, Doc. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, luckily, I, I had teachers that they kind of pushed me in that direction. So, but this is why we have history. I'll ask you another, uh, another one here, and I'd just like to, to talk a little bit about the sources that you used in the book. What did you find most sort of helpful and, and useful? You alluded to a few, and which ones had to be handled with care? Oh, 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 so he struck a chord. Oh, boy. <laughs> the, the grant papers, the grant letters, I can say I was astounded when I actually had to sit down uh, from the University of Tudor Library, and I had to read the hard copy. I'd say sometimes my mind is too much to be reading yeah. online. So I'd sit there and I'd read it, and I'm going, I'm astounded at his correspondence. I'm astounded at all these people he's talking to. I'm astounded at the telegrams he's sending about the West. That astounded me. But then when I went online and I tried to track his policy down, oh my God, the records of the Department of Indian Affairs, the records of the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, the records of the Department of War, the records of all the superintendents, the records of all the people where I was, it's all online. You can read it. Uh, I was literally sitting on my bed on a winter night when I discovered, oh my God, he was appointing the army. He was not appointing missionaries. And I started typing up all the names of these guys, which is now the appendices. That astounded me. Then you gotta go to the National Archives, the greatest repository of Native American history on the planet. It's spectacular. It's all on microfilm. But I wasn't looking for anything specifically on the Indians. I said, I'm going to find the records of the Board of Indian Commissioners. Who are these ten rich guys who were appointed to run our Indian policy who toppled grant? I had never heard of them. I knew they were there, and I'd go to the library, I mean, to the archives, you know, they take you down to the basement, and you have to talk to a librarian. You can't just go in and look for things. You have to say, I know it's here. I'm talking to one of the top archivists, and she said, uh, I go, I want to get the papers of the Board of Indian Commissioners. She said, there's no such thing as the Board of Indian Commissioners. Do you mean the Commissioner of Indian Affairs? I went on the Board of Indian Commissioners. There were rich guys who ran our Indian policy from Grant to FDM. They're here. Well, if they're here, they must be in Maryland. I literally had to sit there for hours and they found them. They found the records of the Commissioner of Indian Affairs and I got to go up into the reading room. You know, I told you so. <laughs> there, there, there they were. And it's that gorgeous room, this wooden room. And you look out to Washington. And I'm opening it up. And I'm going, oh, my God, what is that? Why isn't there a book on these guys? They are, we're going to scrub the Indianness out of them. We're going to turn everybody into good Christians. We're going to make good Episcopalians of everybody. They then take over the whole Indian Affairs Department, and I'm sitting there, um, they, they, that's your question on newspapers, they uh, would get the newspapers of the U.S. and they would cut everything up to read scrapbooks of what they thought, and they were horrified at uh, well, the Modoc War, when Captain Jack revolts. I try to be quiet in historic places, <laughs> but I'm literally going, oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Your question. The guy next to me goes, he goes, you're looking at the records of the Board of Commissioners, right? The, the, the Board of Indian Commissioners? I go, yeah. He goes, hey, you think that's bad? Because I was looking at Oregon. He goes, you should see what the Episcopalians were doing down in Texas. He was there studying the same thing. And, and we start having this conversation. The Board of Indian Commissioners, that FDR finally gets rid of. I go, nobody knows about these guys. That an extra government body of rich guys who put in charge of Indian affairs. I go, I was trained by top guys in the West. They didn't know this. Well, we had to stop talking to each other, but that, that's my source story. It's like, good God. And I, I, again, to, the, to, to have a, a guy who was studying them uh, and were, were hysterical. Like, well, that's, it, that's just fine. The, the library is the place where you 
I didn't mean to. I, I didn't mean to smirch archivists, but they can be very arrogant. They, they start to think they own that stuff. So it's like I I want can I tell you a quick story? When I did Anthony Wayne's book, and I I was in the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. That's more like they're like Janet Cooper. You sit down here, and they sit up. The librarians are up here looking down on you. And I did my best to be quiet, to behave. But one thing that people always worried about, Washington worried that Wayne drank too much. And Wayne always said, I don't drink that much. OK, so my dear and all that. I knew exactly what he drank. I found the bar tab. He had to pay before he comes out to be a general. I go, my god, the man is a drunk. <laughs> so sometimes you think that those places in the world would be an archive of primary sources, and then you run into something like that that just throws everything out of the way. So, so yeah, I, I get over my, Only my sister, my younger sister, is a map maker. She's a cartographer. She does all my. There's some wonderful maps in the book. She's, she does, she's filmers and uh, photos, travel books, but she also, history major, my God, she like helped me, you know, she will help me figure out where exactly was, the, where were the Comanche fighting, and she did, she did Anthony Wayne's uh, plantation in Georgia, just like, it's stunning. She's the only person who will travel anywhere with, uh, to historic sites. Because I embarrass her, I get so excited. Uh, that and whatever Cocker Spaniel I own at the time. <laughs> My current one, James II, King of England and Ireland. So, <laughs> he's very arrogant. <laughs> we found out we're stewards, too. Not only are we poverty stricken Irish, saints be praised, mm -hmm. descendants of the stewards, and they're going to have that coronation and that usurpment of the throne. <laughs> I could go so easily back onto the side. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, please join me in, in thanking Dr. Stockwell and after this time. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you.